First of all, we have compiled um, a directory of expert academics, experts in all fields of um, EU politics. So when we email out all the presentations, the link to that directory will be there. So please be aware of that. Um, so that our panelists don't get inundated with calls and other academics get <laughs> an opportunity to also discuss their thoughts and research. Um, the recording today will also be on the website, hopefully this afternoon, if not tomorrow in the morning. Um, if you're tweeting, please use the hashtag PSA Media. Um, some, some of you have scheduled interviews with some of the panelists later on. Um, if anyone else wants to um, conduct an interview, please either let Stephanie know at the back in the master <laughs> jacket, or, or come speak to one of our panellists um, immediately after the talk. Um, Wi-Fi code, if you haven't got it, is the network is IFG, uh, underscore guest, and the password is IFG. Okay, so usual panellists will speak for up to 10 minutes. <laughs> we always say that, and often, often it goes well beyond, but please, given that there will probably be an awful lot of questions, and then we have, hopefully, at least 45 minutes of questions. Right, so John Curtis, who will, I think, be familiar to all of you, is going to kick off. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to talk about the headline numbers and uh, the opinion polls. Um, those of you who were at Chatham House yesterday can engage in the text of exegesis and how far the story's moved on in 24 hours. Um, okay, um, here is a diagrammatic representation of all of the opinion polls that have been conducted since the beginning of September when the Electoral Commission had sorted out uh, what the question was going to be in agreement with the government. Um, and two things immediately strike you. I've taken the, virtually everything I'm showing you, I've taken the don't knows up, okay? It just makes life <coughs> much easier to follow. Uh, so everything, just, uh, just um, uh, start from the assumption that's the case. Um, two, two things emerge from it. The first is that if you were trying to put a straight line to try and summarize that data, it clearly would be parallel to the horizontal axis, i.e. The broad impression you get is that all the huffing and puffing of the last eight, nine, ten months, absolutely nothing is happening. That's the end of my ten minutes. <laughs> um, the second thing, of course, you all note is ah, it looks a little bit like a heart patient who occasionally springs into life. All of a sudden, we get these gaps and then it disappears again. All right. Um, the other thing I suppose we should say is that, of course, the blue line, by the way, is remain, the green line is leave. But most of the time, it just looks as though remain have been a little bit ahead. But why the sparks to life? Well, the sparks to life is, of course, because of the fact that the internet polls give us a different story from the phone polls. Those sparks to life are the phone polls. The kind of flickering are the internet polls. Um, the truth is, as you can see, the internet polls have literally been telling the same story on average throughout the whole of the campaign. I've simply divided the period up into three broad groups and just taking the average of all the polls in this period. Left hand side is up to the 19th of February when the renegotiation was concluded. The second, the middle group is between the 19th of February and the beginning of April. And the third group is the last uh, seven weeks. Um, and as you can see, internet polls 50-50 all the way through. The telephone polls were well, starting off at around 60-40, they've come down now to around 55-45, but there is a, still a very clear, persistent, continued uh, uh, diversion. Um, and that's um, uh, uh, important um, because it potentially affects the way the campaign looks in a way that can be misleading. Now, third thing you can do, which is I'm doing regularly on the web, my website, is literally simply to my running, running average of the polls. That kind of takes out some of the sparks out of it. But you can still see that occasionally we apparently get movement. And in particular, what you will see here on the right hand side is what I'm going to call the Linton Crosby bounce. All right? This is the excitement caused by Linton Crosby together with Ben Page and Mr. Smorey. Uh, both of whom came up with opinion polls that said, oh, no, 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 it's all right, it's remained, it's way ahead. 
and indeed my winning average moved from actually the one and only occasion when it actually had to leave very narrowly ahead to coming up with very suddenly 55% support on average for Remain, which as you can see was equal highest to where it ever has been. Uh, so quite a lot of another kind of so given the broad stability has however something happened in the last couple of weeks, has in particular the what is it, 4,300 Korean, 3.6%, um, uh, the back of the queue, etc., etc., has uh, this finally perking through to voters that maybe leaving is not such a good idea according to the government. Now, one of the things to realize about all this, and why is this bounce around at all, it essentially bounces around because of the changed numbers of internet and phone calls. And in particular, one of the things to realize is that we are now getting more phone polls relative to internet polls than we did early in the campaign. Uh, this, by the way, doesn't, these numbers don't include BMG's poll that came up last night. It doesn't actually change the story. If you want to update it, that number is now 27, more than 26. But the crucial point to note, in the early phases of the campaign, i.e. basically uh, before the middle of February, we only had eight phone calls in total. Virtually everything was done, being done over the internet. And now, in contrast, we've got a position where we're right now something more than one in three of all the polls being kept be done on the phone. So one of the things, therefore, that's going on is that the psychology of the campaign is being affected because there are now simply more polls being reporting that have been done by phone, therefore have remained ahead, but actually, on average, are not showing remain any further ahead now than they were um, a few weeks ago. That said, well, of course, what we should do is perhaps just look a bit more carefully at what's been going on in the last four weeks, or the last seven weeks or so. Uh, what I've done here is to systematically compare the results of the polls that have been published in the last two weeks, BMG aside, with what they were saying four weeks ago. So rather than just simply saying, well, how does this poll compare with what it said last time, which in some cases a week ago, in other cases a month ago. Let's compare systematically. Are the polls different now from what they were in April? Or have the economic warnings had an impact? Is there a swing to the Tories and Lyndon Crosby's amongst Tories to remain as Lyndon Crosby's complain? Have the older voters finally been won around? Now, one other th thing to note straight away is that the pollsters are constantly tweaking their methodology and so and quite a lot of the recent tweaks have actually been in the direction of favouring Remain. So what I've done here is these figures take out the effect of either Congress's decision to change the number that they headlined or uh, the decisions made by, uh, uh, by uh, YouGov and ICM to slightly change the way in which they were weighting their data. But as you can see, and here's, here's the Linton Crosby excitement, and you know, this was the highest level of support for Remain in any poll so far, and was certainly worthy of a note. Here's the Ipsos Mori excitement, and here are all the dullards. <laughs> and, and BMG is also plus one. And one of the things we of course know about opinion polls in the media is that the media have enough opinion polls that show and suggest that something has changed, it makes life interesting. And they're inclined to ignore all the ones that say, you know what, nothing really has happened, and all that reporting you've been doing in recent weeks has largely been a waste of time. <laughs> um, now that said, I mean, two points to make. Clearly, most polls actually have it at 50% or more. It's clearly still something where we may more likely have the lead. Um, and perhaps, perhaps there's been a wee bit of it. We're going to take the average of all of these, and if I have in BMG, it doesn't make any difference. Maybe less than a half point, and less than a one point swing to remain, but it's not something dramatic. At most, a wee shift. Have Tory voters shifted? Uh, well, maybe a bit, but not very much. This is what I worked out here. I mean, if of course we were simply taking a poll in March, which had more of a low figure for remain, with another poll th th this week both of which are only samples of 800, and therefore inevitably have very few in the way of subgroups of voters. Um, what I've done here is to take all of the opinion polls that have been conducted recently and compared their breaks for how people voted in 2015 with the equivalent breaks for a month ago. So this is now based on seven, eight opinion polls, rather than just comparing one. Okay, in April, on average, we had 46, 54 split amongst Tory voters, being something more likely to vote to leave, and it's now the latest figure is 49, 51, or whatever it is. I mean, there's a very small shift, perhaps, amongst Tory voters, but nothing very dramatic. I've been tracking these numbers for quite a while, and they've been bouncing around between 45, 55, and 50, 50 for quite some time. Um, 
Labour voters and the contrast, no change at all. Um, has the age gap moved? Well, it's true. All right, here we go, taking all the polls. There's a two-point increase in the level of support for Remain amongst the over 65s. But actually, on the same calculation, there's a five-point increase amongst the 18 to 24s. There's no clear evidence here that the age gap has narrowed in any significant way. So I think certainly that aspect of the Linton Crosby thesis isn't uh, 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 important. The, uh, the, the age gap is, of course, long, uh, long been known about. Much less discussion between the polls, but this discussion is now beginning to emerge, partly helped by uh, new government's uh, contribution last Friday and something I published yesterday. But the other thing that we do know about this referendum is that cru a, the other crucial demographic division is by educational experience and educational attainment. Here's the data that YouGov published last Friday from their online version, and as you can see, those who left who left school at 16 or younger overwhelmingly in favour of leave. Those who left school or what college or whatever at 20 years or older are overwhelmingly in favour of remain. This is a really big demographic difference. And the truth is that for the most part, at least, the polls have not been publicly tracking it. I think privately many of them have been, but publicly they haven't. And I think one of the things to look out for is, is whether they're doing the polls now do more than more in terms of making sure they've got these proportions right, because you're not going to get the referendum result right unless you've got them right. Is there, for, however, any evidence that voters, you know, taking that aspect of the Crosby thesis, is there any evidence that voters' attitudes towards the economic consequences of Brexit have changed? Well, NewGov uh, published more on this, they've got a lovely long-term series, I've just taken the end of it. And as you can see, I mean, we've long been of the view that leaving the European Union is, is a plurality of these things, it's not uh, it's going to be economically disadvantageous. This is the group here. Is the group any bigger now than it was a few weeks ago? Answer, no. Even Sir Linton's own data <laughs> shows that attitudes towards the economy have essentially flatlined. It remains an issue, it continues to remain an issue, but it is not clear from any of these public polling data that actually the numbers on the economic consequences of uh, Brexit have been shifted by the various interventions ranging from the Chancellor of Exchequer to the Governor of the Bank of England to Christine Lagarde. Meanwhile, of course, and Matthew is going to talk much more about this, this is, the, uh, this is what people think about the consequences of remaining and leaving Israel immigration. If anything, we're now slightly more convinced that if we remain inside the European Union, we're going to get more migrants here. So if anything, the new side made a bit of progress on this issue. Okay, so those are the key points I want to make. The crucial thing to realize now is that because we've got more phone polls, and I suspect we're going to continue to get more phone polls, the psychology of the campaign is being changed. <coughs> because it now seems we're getting more headlines that says we may go ahead. But actually, the compare like for like, it is not clear that very much if anything has changed at all. Again, also be aware that there seems to be a bit of herding going on amongst the pollsters. They seem to be getting tweak here, tweak there, maybe we are, and all these recent tweaks have been in the direction of putting remain up a bit. Perhaps, perhaps there's been a small swing to remain if one's being generous to Sillington, but the idea is one generous put to me about uh, seven two hours ago, and at that point I wasn't quite sure, that this, we've reached a tipping point in the campaign, that we've clearly got some big shift in public opinion. There isn't enough consistent evidence out there to support that argument. Maybe a little bit of progress amongst Tory supporters. But the truth is, Tory supporters are still absolutely split down the middle, and Cameron and Osborne are still struggling to get the majority of Tory supporters on their side, not least because the various warnings about the economic consequences of Brexit are apparently not hitting home. All of that said, please ahead, probably remain, probably always have been, but probably by nothing back as much as Cameron else would like to be. Thank you, John. Um, now we're going to go over to Kate Nicolato from the University of Boston, who is going to talk more about the campaign. Thanks. All right, so, so John just told us a story where 
why nothing has changed. So you'll be, you'll be pleased to hear that I'm going to tell you about some change, um, whether or not the implications of that are as, as profound as, as what John has told us is, is another story. Um, so what we've been doing as a part of this project is, is tracking what the two sides leave and remain have been during the campaign. So if it's any, if my Twitter feed is any indication, both sides are hitting very hard. Um, but I'm not one of those people who thinks my Twitter feed is representative of the British public. So uh, we decided to take a more scientific approach to this. So what we've been doing is gathering data on every lo local event that both campaigns have held um, since the start of the year, so since the 1st of January. So all different types of events, leafleting, canvassing, street stalls, public meetings, bus tours, what have you. Um, everything we can get. And what does this tell us? It tells us a bit about where the campaigns are going, what types of choices that they're making, but perhaps more importantly, who could be winning the ground war again, because perhaps, um, again, my Twitter feed is, is not, uh, not representative. All right, so in terms of uh, the picture, so while the public's views may not have changed, um, the campaign has certainly evolved. So um, the Leave campaign kicked off their events um, very early in the year, remain a bit later, um, but what we see is um, before the start of the official referendum period on the 15th of April, um, there was over 700 events already that had taken place um, on this. Um, so about 47% of the country had seen anything. Um, but what we see after the official campaign rate referendum period starts, this starts to ramp up very rapidly, right? So um, after the fifth week of the campaign, which ended um, on the 17th or 18th of May, um, we saw that there was almost 3,000 local events. So 3,000 things taking place all around the country. So not only just more events, but spreading out. So now we see that 80% of the country has seen at least something uh, to do with the referenda that take place uh, within their borders. Um, all right, so one of the things to look at kind of regionally is, is what's going on. Um, London is by far seeing the most events around the country. So a quarter of all the events that have taken place are taking place within London. Um, and one of the very, really interesting things is that we see that if we look at all the, re or all the areas in London, so here we're matching data to the parliamentary constituencies, there are only two places that have seen no events. Um, two places, whereas others are seeing more than 10, right? So the cities of, left of, of Westminster um, have seen more than 50, right? So really kind of homing in on, on London. Um, and this will have implications for what we see uh, we see later on. Um, all right, so thinking about the two campaigns over time, because that's perhaps the more interesting thing. How do these events break down? Um, and so here's Leaf. Um, before the start of the official referendum periods, um, they're kind of relatively keeping on par with, uh, with Remain at this point. Um, and we see kind of roughly about uh, you know, 100 and 150 events a week. Um, and so they're now up to about, you can see as this develops over time, they begin to spread out. Uh, we see kind of here, going along, and finally to week five. So after week five, 1100, more than 1100 events around the country. Um, one of the really interesting things about, um, about the Leave campaign is that they have, they have picked up their events, but they tend to be really honing in on a couple of regions. So they're holding a large number of their events in London and also in the southeast. Um, but they tend to be ignoring more significantly other regions of the country. So in very few regions are they covering more than two-thirds of the area in that region. So they're really not necessarily um, diffusing their campaign very significantly across the country. Um, all right, so how does that compare with Remain? Um, Remain the key point is simply that not only are they doing more, they're doing it in more places. Um, and so as we see, you can see the maps as they develop through, this is week one, week two, week three, week four, and week five. Um, and so Remain, on average, with the exception of the first week of their campaign, is on average holding about 140 more local events every week than leave. Um, which is, is relatively significant. So the gap between the two campaigns, which was relatively modest at the start of the official <coughs> referendum period, has now grown substantially um, between the two. Um, and if we look at this breakdown regionally, again, we see, like Leave, Remain is hitting heavily in London and in the, south, in the southeast. Um, but they're getting more coverage of other regions, right? So they are hitting two-thirds of the, of the areas 
in seven regions compared to leaves four. Right? So much broader, uh, much broader and hitting much harder um, in more places. So diffusing, particularly you can see it in this map here, highlights the southwest, um, you know, really hitting hard in the southwest. Um, so that's what, what we looks at like over time. This is perhaps the more, you know, the more important thing. So I mean, what I said, one of the great things about this project is that we can see kind of where they're going, how they're, what the types of choices they're making, and how that's developing over time. But the question that everyone really wants to know is, you know, who's winning? Um, and so, who's winning on the ground? Um, and so, what we can see here from this map, so you can see different shades. So obviously, red is more more leaf, and blue is more remain. And so. Um, at the gray represents where there are no, no events at this stage. Um, and so a couple things that we can, can take from this. Um, at the beginning of the campaign, or before the official referendum period, generally there's some sort of parity in who's winning in more areas, right? So um, prior to the official referendum period, there's only a gap in about 37 areas between the two camps. So Remain is ahead. And this tracks very nicely with the story that John has already told us about kind of what voters think, and that Remain has been roughly ahead um, for, for a great deal of time. The Remain camp has also been ahead. Um, and we see in the first official weeks of the campaign um, that kind of picture. But it's the more recent weeks where we begin to see the gap growing between the two campaigns. So what this represents is the number of areas in the country where Leave is holding more events, the number of areas where Remain is holding more events, and the gap, the Remain advantage, right? So possibly Remain is doing better than Leave. Um, so what we see in the more recent weeks is that Remain is really pulling ahead on the ground. So holding more things in more places, which means they're inundating voters with more information, perhaps, um, than Leave. And so as, as of last week, um, there's a gap of about 100 areas. So 100 seats in the country, um, Remain is holding more events um, than the lead is on the ground. So the picture that we can take from this is that, in general, um, Remain, or sorry, lead is falling behind on the ground. Um, They're not necessarily keeping pace. And when we look at this regionally, we see a very similar picture. Um, so Leave is ahead in only one region, which ironically happens to be the one that I live in, the East Midlands. So no correlation, uh, I promise. Um, well, Remain is ahead in six. Um, so London and much of the north. Um, there's a few regions where there are no differences, uh, meaningful differences between the two camps. Um, that's Scotland and the southeast where both places are hitting hard. But in general, particularly in London, um, Remain has really pulled ahead, and also in, in the southeast, sorry, southwest as well. All right, so we see a picture where they are really, uh, really taking, um, taking the lead. Um, another thing that we can look at this, which is, which is, I think, quite important, is who is making, what types of choices are they making? Are they campaigning in the right places, if you will? Um, and so one of the things we can do is examine where they're holding the more events, what types of seats, what do the populations look like in these areas. And so one of the things that's quite interesting is that Remain is targeting more pro-EU areas, right? So thinking about areas where a larger percentage of the, that area's population is likely to support their cause. All right, so 41% of their events took place in highly pro-EU areas, areas, areas where we can expect they will come out heavily in favor of, of Remain. They're holding a few events uh, in areas that favor Brexit, but not so many. So less than a quarter of their events actually take it place in highly favorable um, Brexit areas. So we see a very different picture for the Leave campaign, who is really scattering their choices over all different types of seats. So they're actually holding an equal number of their events in highly pro-EU areas and highly Euro-skeptic areas, so areas that we might expect to favor um, Brexit um, in, in the vote on the 23rd. Uh, so what we would think about in terms of what does this say about their tactics? I mean, there are generally two types of tactics that one might use in a campaign. You can think about, do you want to persuade voters, or do you want to mobilize your base? Um, and perhaps in a referendum, we might think there's been a lot of talk about turnout um, and how that can make a difference in the, in, in the referenda. Um, and if you think about perhaps mobilization is the key, 
um, to this, getting out there to already support your views. Um, one of the things that we would argue is that, that Remain is perhaps doing a better job of this, um, considerably better job. So not only tar are they targeting more areas that favor their cause, and spending less time on areas that they know they are not going to get people. They're not going to convince the voters in this area to come, come to, to their side. Um, but when we look at this by other types of characteristics, we see this picture even more. All right? So if we look at, if we think about the idea that perhaps urban areas make a better site for a mobilization event, so in, if you put your stall down, um, in the center, center, center of Nottingham, you're going to see better than if you put it out in Southwell, which is a small market town um, outside of Nottingham, right? So thinking about where you're putting those events. Um, and so one of the things that we see is that not only is Remain campaign, campaigning more in heavily pro-EU areas, they're campaigning more in heavily pro-urban areas, heavily pro-EU urban areas, all right? So areas where they are likely to re reach lots of their own supporters. Um, so they like to get more bang for their, for their buck. I don't think that translates as well in, in the UK, more bang for their pounds. Um, so when we think about so the picture for, for Leave is very different. I mean, there are a lot of pro, uh, very Eurosceptic, pro-Brexit um, urban areas. But Leave is not targeting those areas. Just 3% of their events have been held in very urban, um, pro-Brexit areas. So thinking about if you want to mobilize your supporters, um, this would suggest that either they are not taking that strategy, or if they are, perhaps they're not making the best choices about the types of areas um, that they are, are targeting. All right, so to bring this all together, um, the ground war is that has changed. Um, whether or not voters are listening to all that is another story, but parties or the, the two sides clearly hope that they are. On average, about almost five events per area in the country. Obviously, that's spread quite differently over parts of the country, Scotland largely being ignored um, in the campaign. Um, more events in the south um, versus the north. Um, but the, the main takeaway point that is as of now, um, Remain is out campaigning leave on the grounds, and we expect that to continue in the, in the future. So not only are they holding more events in more places, they're holding more events in perhaps better places for their cause. Um, and that suggests that the, the takeaway point that I would give from this is that in, in, given the disposition of voters kind of, uh, on the, uh, at the moment, the campaign itself is likely to solidify uh, remains advantage by kind of amplifying the kind of made public opinion uh, distribution that exists at this stage. Great. Thank you very much. Now, over to the yep. Oh, so just can I add one final yep. thing? Um, we have tons more great stuff on maps and talking about demographics and all sorts of breakdown. I had to be really strategic in my choices for the 10 minutes. So if you have any other questions about that, I'm happy to take them. We have many more maps where those came from. Lots and lots of maps. Um, okay, if, very briefly, I, I'm just going to speak to a specific question, which is, uh, as a journalist in the room will know, is dominating the minds of uh, the Leaf camp which is a strategic dilemma that they're currently facing. Uh, pretty consistently, as John outlined um, a few points behind in the polls, Caitlin then said, Leave also seems to be losing uh, on the ground. Um, should they therefore completely overhaul their strategy with 30 odd days to go and focus on immigration rather than these more, uh, shall we say, highbrow arguments over sovereignty um, and trade. Um, I just like this cartoon. It has absolutely no bearing on the way on my presentation. I'm determined to put on the t shirt perhaps after the referendum. Um, just to really underscore a point that John um, made, I mean, this is very crude, but there is absolutely no doubt that the uh, Leave camp are losing the economic argument. If you just look at the net scores, um, on different ways that this question has been asked. For example, do you, you know, do you think that jobs will be better or worse after Brexit? Do you think the national economy would be stronger or weaker? Do you think pen this would be good or bad for pensions? Yada yada. There's no doubt that uh, the Leave camp are, are, are failing to overturn Remain's advantage on the economy. 
Now, obviously, the lead campaigners are arguing that, some lead campaigners are arguing that what they want to do is establish a score draw on the economy and alongside immigration, which they, which they feel they don't need to mobilize, they will then be able to cross the line. Uh, there is very little evidence that that score draw is happening or is likely to happen with only a few days, um, a few weeks to go until polling day. Where the Leave camp, however, have the advantage is sort of on this dimension, uh, which, which we might sort of simply call some immigration and identity. Um, and this isn't exclusive to Britain. I think you know, our debate has been a little bit insular in that we tended just to think about British politics, but there is actually a lot of research on Euroscepticism across Europe, and that research has had a debate for about 10 years around what's more important uh, in driving the Eurosceptic vote. Uh, are hard economic factors more important, or are so-called soft identity factors more important? And in essence, um, the research, um, my reading of that research would suggest that actually these identity factors are central to driving Euroscepticism. And in particular, there are a few studies um, by some academic colleagues of ours uh, who have looked in particular at attitudes towards Turkey's uh, prospective EU membership and found that opposition to Turkey's EU membership is also a highly significant driver of Eurosceptic uh, voting. If you're interested in that study, you can me an email and I can dig it out. I think it was by Sarah Hall, but I need to double check that. Um, so they, they do have an advantage here on immigration and identity. And we also know that Remain and Leave voters are driven by two pretty fundamentally different motives that Remain voters primarily see their vote as uh, an attempt to protect Britain's economic position, and Leave voters primarily see their vote as being uh, an attempt to reduce immigration into the country and to have more control over the British uh, immigration system. There is no real debate about that, and on Twitter and social media, you know, people always say, well, for me, this is about climate change, or for me, this is about sovereignty. You're fine. Um, but, but, but you are an outlier, okay, in this broader debate. Immigration is uh, the most important uh, driver. And of course, as we also know, this referendum is very different from 1975 in terms of the issue agenda. For 10 consecutive months, immigration has been the number one issue uh, for, for voters. It is a highly salient issue. Um, and even though some polls which, which have asked voters, look, what, what's the most important issue for you in this referendum, and economy sometimes has squeaked past immigration by one or two points, you know, that does not really take away from the central point that for Brexit voters, immigration is by far the dominant consideration, right? So there, there, there is no debate in my mind about this. And leave campaigners who say, well, look, actually, this issue is not, is not that central. I, I, I don't know what evidence they're looking at. Um, now, to underscore the, the point, um, and to make perhaps a controversial point, um, and, and that point is actually, I think, the leave camp in strategic terms um, uh, may find themselves doing a little better if they devoted more attention to immigration uh, in the remaining weeks. And the reason I say that is the chart uh, on, on the slide is taken from uh, the British election study uh, data uh, from a paper that I'm working on with Caitlin. And the one thing that you can see, the nice thing about the survey is it asks quite a few questions about the perceived effects of immigration, just as a starter. And you can see that those voters who are identifying as Brexiteers or Leave voters significantly more likely to feel that immigration has been bad for the economy, uh, significantly more likely to feel that immigration undermines national culture, um, significantly more likely to feel that immigration is a burden on the welfare state. And this is where both we have been focusing, if at all, on immigration, right? It's all been about the NHS the perceived effect of immigration on the NHS. They've argued we've been spending less time here in terms of culture and here in terms of the economy. They've really been tagging onto the NHS. And then we've created a, a sort of composite measure that brings us together, showing how people who feel all of these things, who, who we call are intensely opposed to immigration, uh, an intense measure of immigration skepticism, we can see that is also significantly uh, uh, more likely to be found among uh, Brexiteers. Um, it is also worth stressing that if the Leave camp were to shift onto immigration, 
they may well be um, uh, you know, well positioned to do so from a perspective of English identity rather than British identity. One of the there are two things in this referendum that haven't materialised, which I find quite interesting. One is left-wing Euroscepticism. You know, we had this debate last year, whether it be Owen Jones and Paul Mason and all of these left-wingers running around saying, oh, the EU treat increased terribly and there's a democratic deficit, and what about this free trade push? Well, left-wing Euroscepticism is not materialised, but nor is Englishness. And Englishness actually is incredibly important uh, to this debate because leavers are significantly more likely to identify uh, themselves as being uh, English uh, rather than uh, British. Uh, and so this is where the debate over Labour and UKIP, I think, comes into play, uh, where you've had a, a clear attempt by the radical right to try and mobilise that English resentment um, uh, towards Scotland at the general election last year, and why perhaps David Cameron might not to might not want to continually remind voters that um, you know they could get rid of the Scots by voting <laughs> out in England and allowing the Scots to, to vote in. Uh, and the, because many of these voters might like the idea of a constitutional uh, crisis. But here's the really sort of important bit. It basically just ran all these numbers through a computer and it, and it, it basically telling us what predicts uh, the Brexit vote, right? What predicts whether or not somebody will vote for Brexit. Um, and it just goes a little bit beyond the scriptures. But one of the, one of the interesting things, first and foremost, is that those, those immigration measures, when you look at them individually, um, have uh, significant effects on um, uh, predicting whether or not somebody will vote for Brexit. So if you feel that you know, immigration has been negative across all of these areas, you are more likely to back Brexit. Uh, there is, um, as uh, uh, um, we talked about earlier, some, some, in, some effects around uh, education, and also interestingly, um, party cues. So if, for example, voters are given a strong Eurosceptic cue from the Conservative Party uh, or the UK Independent Party, uh, in particular, sorry, the UK Independent Party, they are uh, likely to be quite responsive uh, to that. Um, but, but more importantly, this is what happens when we actually just replace that analysis with this intensity measure of anti-immigration sentiment. And we basically run a slightly different model and what you find is there's absolutely no question that if vote leave really begins to put the pedal down on this belief, this broader belief, not just about the NHS, but this broader belief that immigration is undermining uh, the British uh, economy, uh, national culture, and uh, public services, uh, that is one of uh, the core drivers uh, of the Brexit vote. There is you know, no, no real debate about that. The economic, economic pessimism, the belief that you think the British economy is going to get worse in the future, perhaps because of the Eurozone and so on, I mean, it's kind of there, but it's not really anywhere close to what this identity, to where this identity driver is. Now, interestingly, for the uh, Eurosceptic, uh, or journalists who are in some of the Eurosceptic newspapers, from Eurosceptic newspapers, uh, we also find that reading Eurosceptic newspapers is also quite a significant predictor of whether somebody will uh, endorse Brexit. So I just wonder, and I don't expect answers, but you know, if you get, for example, the Sun and the Mail and the Telegraph retaining quite a very, you know, really strong Eurosceptic stance right until the very end of this campaign, that could play a significant role. It could, it could make a difference. Um, because people who are being exposed to that Eurosceptic media coverage um, you know, are, are more likely to turn out for Brexit. On the other hand, if we see, and I'm reading the Telegraph at the moment and sort of reading their uh, uh, leaders as being sort of all sitting on the fence, you know, if the Leave campaign doesn't get attacked together, maybe all the support uh, remain. Um, if perhaps some of those papers pull back a little bit, that, that also may well have a significant uh, effect. But by far, uh, in, in my mind, immigration is what this vote is all about. Uh, and, and, and with the vote leave camp being behind, um, I, I think there are some pretty straightforward strategic reasons as to why they uh, may want to put all of their chips uh, on that one issue uh, in the remaining 30 or so days. Great, thank you. Now, finally, Alan, he's going to talk about two issues, um, referendum general and what happens in 
there is a Brexit thing. Yes, so uh, um, thank you. The uh, theme that links the two things that I'm going to talk about is that they relate to the future. So uh, we've heard a lot about what is happening uh, in public opinion and in the campaign, and I'm going to attempt to do that dangerous thing talking about what's going to happen um, in relation to two questions. So, firstly, about the um, dynamics. Oh, uh, well, the next one, there we go. That's a little bit. So, um, uh, two questions relating to the dynamics of public opinion during referendum campaigns. So we know what the polls are showing now, what's going to happen over the coming months, and secondly, what happens uh, if we do have a Brexit vote. So, uh, in relation to that first question, um, there are quite a few people who are attempting in various different ways to uh, explore the question of how opinion might change uh, over the remainder of the referendum campaign. Um, I just want very quickly to put up two things for you. One is a summary of all those various things, which is being produced by Steve Fisher and Rosalind Horrocks, who are doing a kind of compendium of all the various different types of uh, uh, modeling of the future that are being done. Uh, so this is from their website. So they have the polls as the, the, the second row uh, in their analysis there. So that's basically a poll of polls of polls. Um, so it's an average across John's poll of polls and the various other polls of polls that uh, are out there. So that is just looking at the polls as they are now. But all the other things are various different ways of looking at what might happen between now and uh, referendum day. So the betting markets, you know what the betting markets are. Um, expert forecasts relate to various um, um, expressions of what people who might be called experts think uh, might happen uh, in the referendum. Volunteer forecasts come from websites where people, anyone, can basically say what they think the result is going to be. There's some evidence that in some elections, at least, this is a better predictor than expert forecast. But whether that's the case in the referendum, we have no idea. Um, Poll-based models take the polls, but then try to model how opinion is likely to change. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. And finally, the other models are types of models that don't look at the opinion polls at all. Um, but they make a prediction as to what the vote will be on the basis of other factors, most notably uh, the state of the economy. Um, and so far as we're aware, there's only one such model out there at the moment, which has been produced by Matt Fortrup, uh, and he has looked at uh, lots of referendums around the world and looked at um, correlation between referendum outcomes and the state of the economy and how long the government has been in office, and essentially he finds that uh, the worse the economy is doing, and the longer the government has been there, the less, li the le less likely is the government to win, uh, the, more, the higher is likely to be the vote for the other side uh, in the campaign. So looking across all of those various uh, different uh, models, uh, they have a combined mean of 53.8 for Remain, or at least they did last week. They updated it yesterday. Uh, too late for me to put it on the slide. Uh, and uh, yesterday's update has, has a mean of 54.3 uh, for Remain. So reflecting what John was saying, there seems to be a very slight shift uh, towards regression voting for Remain. Um, one uh, particular element of that uh, that I mentioned is the poll-based models, which is what I'm involved in. So Steve Fisher and I are uh, doing an analysis of referendums across all of the world's democracies. We have uh, all the polling data we can find from over 200 referendums, over 1,000 polls, and essentially we're looking at how opinion changes over the course of uh, referendum campaigns. And on that basis, uh, our current model has remained on 55%. So that's taking the polls, the current state of the polls at the starting point, um, but then looking at how things are likely to change. And there are two important elements in that change. One is that we find that opinion tends to shift a bit towards the status quo as the campaign goes on. Uh, it doesn't on average shift very much. So on average in the last 30 days, uh, we, so we have um, 44 referendums in which uh, there are at least five polls in the last 30 days of the campaign. Uh, on average, the shift towards the status quo in those is just over one percentage point. Uh, and there's a lot of variations, so uh, quite a few uh, polls, uh, referendums show no significant change, 
Um, uh, but they're significantly more than show a, a, a shift towards the status quo than away from the status quo. There are only two in the 44 that show a shift away from the status quo over the last 30 days of the campaign. And the other element is that even if you look at the final polls, they tend to overstate uh, the support for change. So support for the status quo tends to be a bit higher in the actual referendum result than in even the final polls. And if you want to read more about either of those things, either the fisher shorts uh, analysis or the work that I'm doing with Steve Fisher, then uh, elections, etc. is the website to look at. On to my second question. Uh, what would happen after a Brexit vote? So political scientists do some things other than try to look at public opinion. Uh, and um, there are also lots of important questions, of course, about what would happen uh, in the event that there were uh, a vote. Uh, for Brexit. I'll just um, offer you some very quick thoughts on three or four, depending on how much time there is. Um, so, first question, uh, first two questions relate to Article 50. So, one is, uh, would, so Article 50, you all presumably know by now, is the provision of the Lisbon Treaty that, uh, that sets out how a member state can withdraw from the EU. The Prime Minister has said that he would immediately invoke Article 50 after a vote in favour of leaving the European Union. The Leave campaign says that we don't need Article 50 at all. We can uh, leave the European Union without invoking Article 50. Um, both are wrong. Um, so there is um, there's, there's, there's certainly no imperative to invoke Article 50 immediately. Um, and legally speaking, the referendum is purely advisory and the Prime Minister could just ignore it. Uh, obviously that's not going to happen. Um, but uh, there's no legal reason to move quickly on invoking Article 50, and there would be every good reason for the UK government to get its negotiating team together and get its negotiating position in order before it invoked Article 50. So, um, going immediately for Article 50 seems unlikely, but on the other hand, uh, the idea that you can leave without invoking Article 50 uh, is very implausible. Um, as I'll just explain in a moment, Article 50 gives the balance of power in the negotiations to the remaining EU states. Why would they give away that power by allowing some negotiation and by some other process? So there's no reason to think that we could leave without invoking Article 50. Um, the other question related to Article 50 is, as I said, how would it affect uh, the negotiations over the terms of Brexit? Um, and essentially, it skews the table, it tilts the table in favour of continuing the United States. It is sometimes said that that is the case because Article 50 says that for the purpose of the, these negotiations, the withdrawing member state is excluded from the room, excluded from the, can, the European Council uh, that conducts the negotiations. And that's a misunderstanding of Article 50. Uh, what the article says is, is basically just that we can't be on both sides of the negotiations. Uh, so there's a negotiation between withdrawing member state and the EU. We can't be on both sides of that negotiation. So we're not we're not on the EU side of the negotiation, deciding what the EU is going to offer us. We're only really on our, our side, deciding whether. But, but we're negotiating with the other countries. Um, but what is the case is that. Uh, um, the Article 50 stipulates that there's a two-year period during which these negotiations can take place, and it requires unanimity uh, among the 27 to extend that period. Um, all of the expert um, uh, opinion that I have heard suggests that getting this done in two years is pretty improbable. We need to negotiate in terms of exit. We also need to uh, negotiate a free trade deal. The idea of leaving without one is not pleasant. Um, uh, and we need to negotiate free trade deals with all the other countries with which the EU already has free trade deals. So that's a separate negotiation, but the UK would have to be doing that alongside uh, the negotiations with the EU. So trying to do all of that within two years uh, looks difficult. Um, but if, if extending that period requires the consent of all the other countries, then clearly all of those other countries are going to try to get what they want out of this negotiation. Uh, so it's going to be a very difficult negotiation um, in which uh, the UK, the UK of course, has more to lose from it going wrong because we're, if, if we are uh, cast out after those two years without a deal, we're in a very difficult situation. 
and, and therefore the balance of power is the least. Um, in terms of domestic politics, um, there is the big question of uh, how a split between the uh, nations would affect the union. So, of course, it's quite possible either that um, we vote leave despite the fact that, particularly Scotland and Northern Ireland, have voted to remain, or we vote to remain despite the fact that England has voted to leave. Um, and either of those scenarios might be difficult. Um, there's a lot. Of, the main speculation is about whether there would, in that, in the first of those cases, be a second Scottish independence referendum. I won't attempt to get open to all of that right now, but um, my view is that that would be very difficult. Uh, large, but most obviously because if Scotland becomes independent when England is not in the EU, then it is creating a border with a non-EU country, um, and that might well make the prospect of independence look less attractive. Uh, so there are big difficulties around that. But in addition to that issue, Sinn Féin has said that it would call a border poll if, uh, if Northern Ireland voted to stay in part of the UK voted out. Uh, the whole Northern Ireland peace process is to some degree predicated on EU membership, so that could be destabilizing. And final point there is the devolution statutes, the laws that create the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Assembly, and the Northern Ireland Assembly, all state that those bodies must uh, adhere to EU law. Any law that they pass that uh, violates EU law is not law. Uh, if we want to leave the EU in a non-messy way, then we would have to amend those statutes. Uh, by convention, that requires the consent of the Scottish Parliament, the Northern Ireland Assembly, and the Welsh Assembly. If Scotland has voted by the state, Scotland has voted by a big majority to remain, uh, it seems to be vanishingly improbable that the Scottish Parliament would give its consent, in which case we have a major constitutional mess. <laughs> And finally, uh, the, the question, could there be a second referendum? I've already talked too long, that's a very complicated question. Uh, there are lots of different referendums, to, to, well, various different possible referendum questions. So we have to think uh, about what the question is. Um, but whatever the question is, um, it's very difficult to work out a scenario that we can make a second referendum. So uh, ideas of a second referendum are problematic. Thank you, Clearly, if there is Brexit, there's lots of work from politics. <laughs> 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 lots of grants out there.